Hello golf fans, Chris Durrell here with Rotopros.com to bring you my DFS PGA cheat sheet tutorial video. Just going to be going over uh, some things on the sheet, how to create your own copy, how to build your own models, what all the stats mean, how I put it all together each and every week. Before we get started, if you're not a Rotopros member, make sure to get over to Rotopros.com. Get your free trial, click the sign up button in the top right hand corner here, and when you do that you see that we have three different options for you, weekly, monthly, and yearly subscriptions. It's five bucks a week, fifteen bucks a month, hundred and fifty bucks a year. With the weekly subscription, you're gonna get a three day trial. With a monthly and yearly subscription, you're gonna get a seven day trial to come in, see what we're all about in, in our Slack chat. That's where we kind of run things. Dane and I cover the PGA product, and each and every week he does an article. We do a joint podcast together, previewing the course, um, as well as my cheat sheet, which you can get, gain access to through that Slack chat as well. And then what me and Dane, Dane have been doing here um, since the start of the Sony Open. Open when he joined the team is each round uh, round one two three and four for the showdown we provide news and notes as well as some statistics from the round before or rounds before depending on which round as well as some strategies and some players so make sure to get over to rotorpros.com sign up today come in and check out what we're all about let's get into the cheat sheet tutorial video so as I mentioned in the intro here, I'm going to be going through my DFS PGA cheat sheet, just showing you a little bit about it for anyone that's new, possibly a refresher for those of you that have been uh, members for a while now, I've been using my sheets for a while, um, are familiar with some of it, I've added a few new things, I'm planning on adding a whole bunch more, so I will be redoing this video once I get some of that stuff in. I'm also going to go a little bit through the DFS um, PGA round one showdown sheet that I have for the Waste Management Phoenix Open just to kind of give you some insight to some of the things that I've added for showdowns and some things that I will be adding as the as the rounds go on there as well. So let's just get started. First of all, if you're wanting to make your own copy of the cheat sheet, I know there's a lot of you out there that do want to do this to either adjust the models um, inside the cheat sheet, what you're going to need to do, or even if you just want to sort the columns, if you want to sort by FanDuel, you can't do that right now, it's a view only. So what you're going to want to do is go up to File, click Make a Copy, name it whatever you'd like here. As you can see, I just named it a copy of the regular cheat sheet. And click OK, it's going to open up another version. It's going to be an editable version for you. So that'll allow you to sort sheets. So if you want to sort FanDuel pricing, I just click somewhere in that column D, and then I go up to data and sort Z to A, which is highest to lowest, and now we're sorted by FanDuel pricing. So you can do that anywhere. Uh, for instance, if you wanted to, again, now if you want to sort by official world golf ranking, which is this column G, you click anywhere in that column G, go up here. Now for golf ranking, um, you know, lower the number is better, so we want to sort Z to A this time. So we're now looking at this sheet in terms of players ranked by official world golf ranking. So you can do that for any column on the sheet if you want to see um, maybe who's ranked, who did well here at this tournament last year. We can go back up to data here and sort A to Z. So here's your leaderboard. So on the sheet, you're going to see many things. We've got player information. So of course, we've got DraftKings salary, FanDuel salary, odds, official world golf ranking. And then I've got uh, DraftKings points averages for the last two and last five events. I know some of you wanted to um, wanted me to get FanDuel in there as well. It's just a little tougher. With DK, you can actually download a CSV after the tournament and get those points easily, where I've built a uh, pretty big database now, two, three years of sample size. But the problem with FanDuel is you can't download that unless you want to go through player by player and get that information. So as of right now, there is no uh, fantasy averages for FanDuel, something I am definitely looking into in the future. Salary to odds differential. So this is just a ranking of um, odds to win versus DraftKings salary odds versus FanDuel salary odds and then over here just kind of uh, just a little bit of a look at the difference between the two so for instance uh, we'll kind of pick one that stands out here a little bit we'll just go down the list here here's one here okay so we got Billy Horschel he's 25th in odds to win um, as of this was updated on Tuesday afternoon he's 37th and 36th in DraftKings and FanDuel price and so there's a little bit of an edge there of course everything in these columns green is going to be good red's going to be bad like you're looking at uh, Martin Laird here he's 54th in odds he's 40th in FanDuel salary 46th in DK so a little bit better pricing on DK but still um, negative value in terms of salary to odds differential there so that's kind of how I look at that um, usually I key in on this a little bit more once we start getting down into the 7 and 6k range and really find some players that do stand out there as possible values on one side or the other sometimes possibly both 
So then we move over into the blue range here, and that's going to be your course history. Um, so for courses where there's just one um, course used like this week, TPC Scottsdale, we've got the last five years here. And I always, if there's a two course rotation, three course rotation, I'm going to label that up top here just so you're going to be able to see that, what we're looking at. And then we just got average. Uh, that's just average finish um, over the last five years with the results here. And a missed cut can sometimes be hard to pick out, but what I wanted to do was instead of just putting MC for missed cut, I actually wanted to weigh that because I believe there is a difference in missing the cut by, say, a stroke, two strokes versus missing the cut by seven strokes. So uh, just a little bit more weight, say, on a seven. These are missed cuts, obviously, 76 and 82nd, but they're not nearly as bad as, say, some players down here you start looking at finishing 120th, 118th, 113th. So just puts a little bit more weight on that in terms of course history. And the same goes for form. I do the same thing. Um, instead of the missed cut, I'm uh, ranking the whole field 1 to 156 or however many players are in that field. So then we move into uh, the green section, which is going to be your raw stats. And by raw stats, I just mean this is the actual stat, like your actual driving percentage, your actual driving distance, not the ranks. We'll get into the ranks shortly. That's how we are going to make our models. Um, so we've got strokes gained, first of all, and that's where a lot, I would say, probably 60% of my model comes from every week is these strokes gained stats. I really like them. Some tournaments... We can't quite use them. They don't have the shot tracker out there to be able to give us that information. Um, but some of the stats do. And most of the time now we're getting into this this fold of the season where strokes gained is going to be very relevant. So you got strokes gained total. That is a total of, you know, off your tee approach, around the green, putting. It's your whole entire game. And then we break it down tee to green, which includes off the tee approach and around the green. Um, and then off the tee plus approach is your strokes gain ball striking and that's this column AF here. That's one that I use uh, very highly each and every week. <clears throat> what I've done a little bit more this season is instead of trying to tweak the model with you know seven or eight or nine different stats each and every week, I try and keep it fairly simple each and every week and just kind of tweak one or two different stats depending on the course and what players I think are going to excel on the course there. So then beside that, we've got the putting stats. We've got uh, putting average, which is putts per greens and regulation. We've got three putt avoidance. We've got putting inside 10 feet, 10 to 15, 15 to 20, and putting over 20 feet. That's more for visual reference for me. Um, the only ones I really like to put in my model um, on a given week would be that three putt avoidance on, say, very large greens. Um, very undulated greens as well, where we possibly see a lot of three putts uh, throughout the year. So that's where that comes from. Then we've got driving distance, driving accuracy, and good drive percentage. Um, pretty straightforward here in terms of distance and accuracy. Uh, the good drive percentage is a combination of your driving accuracy plus greens and regulation um, that are hit when you do not hit um, the fairway. Um, so it's, it's kind of a good indicator on tournaments uh, where you're only seeing about 50 to 60% of the field hitting the fairway. Good drive percentage is something we're definitely going to want to look at. It's players that maybe do well from the rough. And that coincides with the approach stats here, rough proximity. So I kind of look at good drive percentage and rough proximity together um, when it comes to courses where guys aren't going to be hitting a lot of fairways. So yeah, we've got greens and regulation, overall proximity, uh, fairway proximity, um, like I said, rough proximity, and then we got the distances. If you want to actually break down, if you know if you're at a tournament where there's going to be a lot of long iron shots, uh, very long course, we're going to want to look at uh, proximity from 175 to 200 and 200 plus yards. And then we jump into the scoring stats: par three, par five, par f par three, four, and five scoring. Par 5 birdie or better percentage, um, which does include a little bit more eagles. So if you get a tournament where there is a lot of eagles, all four par 5s may be reachable by the field. We really want to you know, separate ourselves with one or two eagles during a week in terms of fantasy scoring. That's uh, one column that I would look at. Overall scoring average, scoring average before the cut. Um, so that's something we can definitely use, you know, in terms of showdown. I'm also going to be adding round one and round two scoring to this as well now that I'm doing showdown sheets. And then we've got round three and round four. Bogey avoidance overall, birdie or better percentage, which is going to be huge um, most weeks. You know, looking at tournaments where the winning score is going to be minus 12 or, or lower, definitely birdie or better percentage. Um, looking at tournaments where, you know, you can get into a lot of trouble, you can give strokes back to the field, maybe a lot tougher course, U.S. Opens, that sort of thing. I'm definitely going to be looking at a little bit more bogey avoidance versus birdie or better percentage. 
Then at the end, you got your ground the green stats, um, the actual scrambling number. I prefer to look at strokes gain around the green versus scrambling. Um, and then we've got sand save percentage here if you're looking at a course with, uh, you know, a ton of sand. And then just next to that is just in the orange here is the rankings of each one of those stats that we just went over. Now, it go, I put it into rankings so that we can actually build a model off of these stats and put it together each and every week. So as you can see right now, and uh, this would be row three in the orange, that's where I put my weights. So right now, 20% on stroke gained approach, 10% on stroke gained off the tee, 5% on around the green, 5% on good drive percentage. Then we've got par four, uh, par four scoring average, birdie or better percentage, both at 25%, and then par five birdie or better at 10%. And that all equals this 100% here. So if you're coming in and making your own model, you've created your own copy and you wanna adjust this a little bit, say you wanna go birdie or better percentage down to 15, so that takes us down to 90 here, so we need 10 more, and you want to put maybe 10% on bogey avoidance, you can definitely do that. I try to keep that as 100. So that's our stats model. So then, beside that is the overall model. So we have our stats, which just ranks the model that we just did with all the stats, and I've got 40% weight on stats. And then we've got course history, 15% on course history, and that's just ranking going back over here and looking at the course history. This is just ranking the average over the last five years. Same with current form in the next column, and same with DK point averages. The last five is the one that I use. I will be adding into next week's sheet the last two, the last five, and then as we get more into the season, I'm going to add the last 10 DK points there as well so that we can just kind of have a look at a you know short-term, um, mid-tier, and then some long-term success in terms of players that help us you know figure out different trends if it's if a player's maybe trending in a good direction just more the information the better in terms of trying to decide between players because we do have a large field of players every week with pga so then once we get that these four here cy to db uh in yellow here i also want that to add up to 100 and then that gives us an overall rank looking at stats course history form which is just average finish and then DraftKings scoring um, I've got that set a little bit higher normally I'm probably gonna go that at 30 form at 15 and then oops form down at 10 because there are some players that do stand out Cameron Champ is one of them that stood out I do have another sheet I am working on right now and it's DraftKings points ranking um, compared to finishing position and you know, you get some players that make a lot of birdies. They do make a lot of bogeys. They're getting finishes, say, in the top 30s, um, but their DraftKings scoring is higher than some players that are, you know, maybe finishing top 20 who are getting a lot more pars, a lot less bogeys, but a lot less birdies in there as well. So I really I really feel that we, we want those guys that are going to be scoring those DraftKings points with birdies and bogeys. We can definitely give up. Now, it all depends on your... On your uh, um, which sheet you're looking at, whether it's the overall tournament sheet versus the showdown, because in showdown, it's definitely a lot more important to concentrate on birdies because rounds one, two, and three do not have finishing position points. Um, it's just strictly the scoring points. And you can see that. I've also got a tab here down at the bottom. It's in purple called DraftKings scoring. So it's comparing the regular, the showdown, and the weekend golf. Um, so as you can see here, Looking at birdies, three points for a birdie for a weekend as well as regular, but 5.75. So almost double the points for birdies in showdown. So um, that's where I'll really create my model on the showdowns and I'll put a lot more weight on birdie or better percentage versus some of the other stats. So some of the other tabs here at the bottom while we're going through that. We've got the course, which is just a, you know a little look at the scorecard. And then I break down the par fours um, into lengths. We've got course history, so this is the last five years course history, uh, place and score of each player. And then we've got the scorecards, the actual scorecard with all the player scores added up and together looking at this. So what I really use this for is not just to see which holes are going to be the most difficult. Like as we can see here at TPC Scottsdale, the par fives are bar by far the easiest. This little stretch of 16, 7, or 15, 16, and 17 is the easiest stretch on, on the course. So I'm kind of looking for trends like that. And then down here, how many eagles are being scored on the tournament? So there's a lot here. That's why I'm looking at par 5 birdie or better percentage versus just par 5 scoring. 
and then we can see the distribution of birdies between the pars threes, fours, and fives. Um, so while it's only 36% of the birdies come from the par fives, you have to keep in mind there's only three par fives on the course. So par five scoring, you're going to need to score there. Um, if you can get an eagle or two during the week, I think you're going to put yourself ahead. But in terms of this tournament, um, I'm definitely looking at uh, par four scoring as a separator because those are definitely the hardest holes in a place I think a player can, can separate themselves from the field. So that's there for all five years as well. Then we've got player statistics. These are for all the players that uh, made the cut that week. Um, then we're looking at the average driving accuracy, greens and regulation, uh, average birdies per player for the tournament, and then I just kind of look at the last five-year rolling average of what the driving accuracy was and what the greens and regulation was just for kind of figuring out the stats model at the start of the week. Um, so you can use that for your research as well. Then we've got the targets tab, um, not filled in here. It is filled in on the member sheet, which you can find um, in the chat. And I will have up to 20 players here and uh, with you know cash gpp value play pricing for both dk and FanDuel, and then there's also some notes that i will add in here as well if anything per you know stands out to me um you know stats over the last 10 rounds and i do use fantasynational.com for more of my current stats going back to the main cheat sheet here when you're looking at my stats rankings here in green the raw stats this comes from another sheet where I'm looking at a combination of this season stats as well as a more long-term model looking at last season stats. So at the start of the year when we start the fall season, I'm almost one, well, have to be 100% looking at 2019 or sorry, 2018-2019 season stats. And then as the tournament progresses or as the season progresses and we get more tournaments sample size in there, I start expanding a little bit right now, for instance, I'm at 80% 2019-20 stats and down to 20% on 2018-19 uh, stats. So as we get into probably into May, June, I'm going to be almost 95% on the new season stats. And that's coming along as well. I'm working on a database where I can start breaking down last five rounds, last 10 rounds, last 15 round stats as well. So that's something that's to come in the future as well. So that is everything that goes into the sheet itself um, on any given week, it takes me a long, I start setting this sheet up usually right after lock on Thursday going into the next week. I start doing the course history and then once the current tournament's over, I'll go and I'll update all the stats and the official world golf ranking and the DraftKings scoring. And then Monday morning is when I'll go in and I'll add the DraftKings and FanDuel salary and the odds and I will adjust my stats model. Um, during this time, I add a ton of stats trends um course history you know notes news and notes and stuff like that on players in the chat um leading up to it before i release the sheet then the sheet comes out and i start filling in my plays uh, monday and monday night tuesday and then i usually have it finalized by about 3 p.m eastern on wednesday um like i said you can check that top targets tab and if you're ever wondering like on here i'm gonna have say uh, players labeled John Rahm in blue, Justin Thomas in blue. I believe I got Webb Simpson. Uh, he's going to be a core play for me this week. You can always find the legend here. So green is core plays, blue are GPP plays, yellow are value. And this is the same between all, um, every sport that I do a cheat sheet for. It's same legend. It's the same way that I label them. Uh, purple would be cash games only. I just don't feel like their upside is there, but I feel they, they're good for cash. That would be kind of like a player. Um, Maybe a terrible putter. Let's just go and look at one right here. So Corey Connors is one that stands out to me. He makes a ton of cuts. He's got top 25 finishes. I believe he's made six straight cuts, all top 20 finishes. The upside is somewhat capped for him as that price starts to rise just because his putting is well below average, which really caps that upside in my opinion. But his elite ball striking gets him uh, making cut after cut after cut, which I definitely like for cash games, being that he's below that 8K range. Once he would start to you know get up into that mid-8K to 9K range, it's a little bit different story. I'd have to look at things a little bit closer. But that's kind of why I would label some guys cash games only versus, say, like a core play. So that pretty much covers everything. Like I said, if you want to get the copy of the cheat sheet um, with all my highlighted plays, I've got the targets tab updated as well. Like I said, I have that fully updated by Wednesday afternoon. Um, definitely get into the chat, get your copy of the cheat sheet. And uh, before we get done here, I'm going to jump over and just show you round one, what I did here. So the, obviously, 
Round one is going to be first round leader bet um, in terms of odds. Looking at that here, rest of the sheet is all the same. Um, DraftKings uh, salary is obviously different. And then what I've done is I put in the tee time wave just because, you know, depending on the tournament, we can maybe get a bit of an advantage, whether it be a weather advantage in the morning versus the afternoon wave or a three course rotation. I always label the courses, which players on which course each round. So you're going to be able to see. Then I'll go ahead and highlight my plays again that I like for showdown. But like I said, when it comes to showdown, I would suggest you don't have to make a new copy because I'm going to do this automatically. And I'll just show you what I'm going to do right now because this is the actual DFS uh, PGA Round 1 Showdown sheet for the, the Phoenix Open. So you will be seeing this video come out before the Phoenix Open lock hits. So what I'm probably going to do here is take some emphasis off par for scoring, which I think can help a player separate himself from the field. And now that would be more of a full tournament thing, a player that does well over those par fours. So I'm going to reduce that down to 15 and I'm going to take the model up to 35% birdie or better percentage. I'm going to put more on the stats here. I'm going to go 50% on that. And I want, you know, in terms of form, I'm probably just going to crank that rate down to zero. And then we can go right up to 35 in terms of DraftKings. Uh, scoring there as well so a little more emphasis on birdie or better percentage which makes sense there's no finishing position points there's no cuts to be made in round one showdown we want as many birdies as possible from our players and the least amount of doubles and bogeys and stuff to capitalize uh, in cash games there um, and gpps i generally play cash games for showdown and it just comes down to um one i've just been more successful at it Two is a timing thing. I don't have time to put together, uh, you know, three, five, 20 lineups. I just like to make one lineup each and every day, run it in a bunch of cash games and a couple single entry GPPs. And that's the way I roll for showdowns. Um, it's been very successful to start the year. So um, that's how I create that model in terms of the showdown sheet. And if you have any questions on either of these sheets, definitely reach out to me in the chat on Twitter at Jaeger underscore bombs nine. Um, or just leave a comment in this video below and I'll get back to you for sure. Thanks for checking out the video and let's go out there and get some green screens this week at the Phoenix Open and throughout the entire season. Good luck everyone.